Vanessa is an associate professor of kinesiology in the College of Education and Allied Studies at California State University, East Bay. She received her PhD with a concentration, uh, sorry, she received her PhD in kinesiology with a concentration in biomechanics from the University of Waterloo. She completed a postdoc fellowship in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Washington University in St. Louis at the School of Medicine there. Her undergraduate degree was in bioengineering from the University of California, San Diego, and her master's degree was in exercise science from the University of Buffalo. Vanessa is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, and she's been the co-chair of the Bone and Osteoporosis Network Exchange, also known as BONE. Uh, that's one of the interest groups here at ACSM. Her long-term research goal is to investigate how to grow a strong skeleton, specifically how to develop screening tools to monitor bone health across the lifespan. With that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Yingling for her presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to Dr. Kraft and ACSM for this opportunity to present and to Aldo for all his tech support. All right, so my goal today is to give you an overview of what we do and why um, at Cal State East Bay. So over the last seven years, we have built a muscle bone group in the Department of Kinesiology at Cal State East Bay. And prior to that, my work was mainly using animal models. So this has been a huge learning experience for me as well as my students. So I'm gonna first describe what we research and then I'll move on to the bigger picture and put it in a bigger context. And then why it should be important to you as students and to the ACSM staff. So our research question. Our goal is to investigate the relationship between common muscle function tests and bone strength variables in healthy populations. And with the bigger goal to answer the question, can a muscle function test be used as a field measurement to assess bone strength. So just to give some, some background to the function of the skeletal system, it is um, structural in nature, it helps with mobility, it's the site of our muscle attachments, it provides su su uh, excuse me, support, so it's our load-bearing structure, and it also provides protection. So our skull protects our brain, our ribs protect our heart and lungs, and then our vertebra protect our spinal cord. It's also a reservoir for mi minerals, in particular, calcium and phosphorus. So it has these two functions that occur simultaneously and sometimes compete against one another. And also just to orient you to some of the anatomy of bone, there are two types of bone. So we have the trabecular, also called cancellus or spongy bone, that's in the epiphysis or the ends of the bone. And I just want you to note that it's a lattice type structure with um, plates and rods of bone and then many holes. And that's why it, um, some people call it spongy bone because it's not solid. And then we have cortical bone in the diaphysis or the mid shaft of our long bones. And you can see it's much more dense there's much less porosity, almost no porosity to the naked eye, um, very different from our trabecular bone. So our goal is to see if muscle function tests can predict bone strength. So we need to measure bone strength. And so there are three main factors that contribute to bone strength. We have the density or the material of the bone. And I liken that to like the ingredients, right? The cake mix or the cookie, what goes into whatever you're baking, the materials. Then we have the mass or the size of the structure or the amount of material used. And then the third factor is the architecture. And that's how it's built, it's geometry. And for our purposes in bone, it's the distribution of that material from the neutral axis of the bone. An example of how these factors interact to build bone is from an article in Kinesiology Today that's put out by the American Kinesiology Association. And this is one of the take home points. And it's 
mainly that one parameter, such as bone density, cannot fully describe bone strength. And so I have an example here of a 36-year-old male, the cross-section of their tibia compared to a 42-year-old male. And you can see they look very different, right? The cross-sections are different. The 36-year-old male has a thicker cortex and a much more narrow bone. So that would be a smaller moment of inertia, a smaller architecture, if you will, compared to the 42-year-old male who has a wider bone. However, they can have this equal bone strength. So the point is these three parameters can, can kind of mix and match to get a functional bone. So in our 36-year-old male who has a smaller moment of inertia or smaller architecture, he would have a higher bone mineral density compared to the 42-year-old male who would have a larger moment of inertia, so a, a more optimal architecture, get a lower bone mineral density, and they would have the same strength. So there's not one way to build a functional bone. All right, so what measurements do we use to assess bone strength? Well, at East Bay, we use the PQCT, which is the Peripheral Quantitative Computed Tomography. And you can see the machine up here in the upper right. And so we have uh, the machine with a gantry or a hole in the center that allows our peripheral bones, our legs, in our arms to be scanned. It has minimal exposure to radiation. It's lower than DEXA even. And it separates cortical and trabecular bone regions. And we also have um, the opportunity to scan different regions along the length of a bone um, that also focus either on the trabecular or cortical bone regions. And typically a 4% site will give you mainly trabecular bone and then you go up to the mid diaphysis between 50 and 66% site to get more of the cortical bone. The biggest benefit of PQCT is the 3D architecture at these different sites. So at the 4% trabecular site, here's a scan. It's at the distal tibia. Um, tibia. So here on the left, the bigger bone is the tibia, and you can see the fibula. And then the blue, the less or the more blue color is our muscle, and then followed by um, subcutaneous fat in our skin. So we can get the three measurements of bone strength from these scans. So first we can get the density, and here it's based on a color scale. And so I'd just like to, you to note that um, you know, the, the red and the yellow are less dense than the white color. And you can see that the trabecular bone comes up as less dense because it's not solid bone. And it has that lattice framework with holes, so it has a lower density overall. We can also get the mass via a cortical area measurement. So that tells us how much bone is in the scan. And then we can also get the architectural features. So the moment of inertia, total bone area. We can do this again at, the, at a cortical site, which is either at the 50% 50, 50 to the 66% site. And so you can see it looks very different. Again, we still have the tibia on the left and our fibula on the right. We have the muscle and you can see the subcutaneous fat in blue, which is less dense. Um, the bone, notice the cortical bone is at a higher density level because it, it is not, does not have a high level of porosity. We can also get mass or the cortical area of the bone, and we can also get the architectural features. And so architecture is key. And here's an image from an article by Hart et al. in 2017 highlighting this. So we have three different bones with three different architectures. The key is that the aerial BMD is the same in all three of these bones. But as you get a wider or larger moment of inertia, as we go from left to right, your bending strength increases significantly. So architecture is, is a key component. And it's also a key component because that is the feature of bone strength that changes um, after we exercise. 
or, and also changes during development. All right, and then also just to compare again, the DEXA, which is the clinical tool that's used currently, and the PQCT, the clinical is an aerial BMD, so you get a 2D projection of both the cortical and the trabecular bone kind of combined, as opposed to the 3D PQCT assessment. And so here's an example of a, a DEXA, and again, it's a 2D projection as compared to the 3D picture of from our PQCT. We also measure muscle function tests because we are trying to find out if a muscle function test can be a surrogate for bone strength. There is a clear connection between muscle and bone. They are intimately related. So the test that we use for muscle function is an impulsive or a power test that's measured from a vertical jump more of a neuromuscular measurement. Then we also have two strength measurements. The hand grip, which is a global muscle function measure, also focuses on the upper limb. And we, we use a 1RM leg press test to focus on the lower limb. So what what are some of our results over the last few years? These are some key results from a study that we did on the tibia of college athletes. Um, the graphs, the y-axis is peak power measured from that vertical jump test using the Sayers equation. And then I will explain the, the rest of these um, variables in, in a moment, but just to highlight on, on panel A, the SSIP is our bone strength measurement. And that, as I said, we got from the vertical jump test and it was predictive of bone strength. We also were able to get an architecture measurement, which is our moment of inertia, also predictive of bone strength. The cortical area, which is the amount of bone, again, a good, um, predictor of bone strength, and then our CBMD is our density measurement. And density tends not to be predictive of bone strength because our, our mineral density is established fairly early in life. If we compare our results to previous results using a similar methodology, um, so I just for comparison, I want to change our R squared value into an R value. So we have an R value of about 0.6896. And we had good comparison with Jans et al. in, 200, in 2015 who, who investigated 17-year-olds. Baptista et al. Um, used the vertical jump for eight-year-olds. And King in 2017 um, investigated 19-year-olds. So there's good evidence that power measured from a vertical jump could play a role in a bone health assessment. Also as part of that study, we compared the three muscle function tests. The first being the vertical jump. And um, this is our, the same SSIP from the previous slide. So we have the vertical jump doing, being a, a very good predictor compared to the hand grip, which is, was not such a good predictor of bone strength and the same with the 1RM leg press. So the comparison of those three tools, it came out that um, all muscle function tests do not predict bone strength in a similar fashion. We went on to look at radial strength. So the previous studies were all in the tibia. We took um, a larger cohort and looked at radial strength. So this was a healthy population that with up to um, age 60 in our population. And again, we looked at both cortical and trabecular bone in this study, and we compared vertical jump to a rel relative grip strength. So the lower limb vertical jump was still a good predictor of a upper limb radial bone strength in both cortical bone and trabecular bone. 
and hand grip did a pretty good job at the cortical sites and was not as predictive at the trabecular sites. So again, this kind of establishes that vertical jump could be a predictor of bone strength of both the tibia and also the radius. So what are the next steps? Muscle function tests in particular, vertical jump tests, are strong predictors of bone strength. More data is needed in children and diverse populations. Currently, the clinical monitoring for bone strength is expensive and it's, it's um, highly technical and typically done only in older, older populations or in children who have bone conditions, right? So it's not for healthy populations. So currently there's no easy screening tool for coaches, teachers, or clinicians to use. And that seems to be a good opportunity to develop field tests for the assessment of bone health. In addition, the next step is also to determine cutoff points or the accuracy, the sensitivity and specificity of these measurements. And King, during her master's thesis, has started doing some cutoff points of power for BMD values from DEXA. And so this curve analysis is a well-known and established procedure for determining clinical thresholds for screening and diagnostic tests. So that would be a next step to do more work in that area. And Sam Marie et al. have done that for hand grip, but not yet for vertical jump tests. And they put grip strength in terms of low risk, some risk, and high risk. So we're seeing a movement towards using or establishing some of these field measurements for bone health, but we still need a little bit more data to push things forward. So that's kind of what we research in general. Now for the bigger picture. Why is a screening tool of bone health important? So the problem is that we have a condition, osteoporosis, which is a microarchitectural deterioration of bone strength or bone tissue. Currently 44 million males and females over 50 have osteoporosis. And that combined with sarcopenia, which is a decrease of muscle mass and muscle function, can increase the risk of bone fracture, which can result in loss of independence and high morbidity and mortality rates. Every three seconds, an osteoporotic fracture occurs, costing more than 20 billion annually. And in fact, 70% of people over age 65 with osteoporosis have not been screened and so do not even know they are at risk. And that's why osteoporosis is termed the silent disease. Fracture risk is a growing problem worldwide. Based on a UN report from 2017, there's going to be a two-fold increase in people over 60 years of age in the next 30 years. So our elderly populations are growing and we would anticipate our risk of fracture will grow as well. So screening is not important because osteoporosis, our screening is important because osteoporosis is not a disease of the elderly. Fracture may occur in the elderly, but osteoporosis is a pediatric disease with geriatric consequences. So we can approach osteoporosis or bone health in two approaches. One being treatment. So we can try to decrease the rate of bone loss during um, our older years. So here, this graph is showing bone mass and, and age on the x-axis, and we can see there's different rates of bone loss as we age. And if we decrease the rate of bone loss, then we'll avoid this risk of fracture region of the graph. Or we can focus on prevention. And for prevention, we're trying to increase or optimize peak bone strength so basically increasing our starting point during our younger years. So as we lose bone mass, um, as we age, we still avoid that risk of fracture. This graph also illustrates the pre prevention approach. So we have bone strength on the y-axis and the lifespan along the x-axis. And this graph is showing that physical activity especially during adolescence, 
can increase bone strength um, across the lifespan. Early intervention is a great prevention approach because 90% of our bone mass is accrued by 20 years of age. In addition to early intervention, improved monitoring across the lifespan of bone health would kind of help facilitate, facilitate that process. So the solution would be an easy to administer and inexpected, inexpensive field test that we could use throughout the lifespan. I also wanted to highlight that our, our research and goals do align with the ACSM mission, which promotes and integrates scientific research, education, and practical application of sports medicine and exercise science to maintain and enhance physical performance, fitness, health, and quality of life. So the research that we do at Cal State East Bay, focusing on this optimate, optim, um, maintaining bone strength and optimizing peak bone mass and, and trying to come up with some screening tools for bone health will contribute to quality of life from decreased fractures uh, and maintaining health. We also have an education component and in collaboration with American Bone Health and the Boys and Girls Club of Oakland, we presented a four week after school program focused on bone health. And in particular, focusing on jumping and um, bone healthy activities. And that seemed to be a pretty good draw for kids. It's a fun way to kind of educate them on bone health while they're young which is where it can be very effective. And for practical application, um, we hope to contribute to data that would help integrate a vertical jump test into the fitness gram. All right, so moving on from the bigger picture to the why is this important to you? As students and as ACSM, staff. So one reason why our work in bone health generally is important is bone is not a use it or lose it tissue. And so I think this is super important for students in particular to understand because you can positively affect your clients, patients, students, depending on your career goals for a lifetime. So here's some data from um, Warden et al. from 2014, and they used a model of baseball players. And so they have the non-throwing versus the throwing arm. So this is a great internal control of looking at how loading or exercise affects bone strength, and in particular, bone architecture. And so we can see, in general, the throwing arms are larger, have a, a more optimal architecture than the non-throwing arm. Right, so exercise is good for bone. But in particular, um, moving to the right-hand graph, you can see the zero axis, and to the right is percent differences between throwing and non-throwing. So anything positive favors throwing or favors exercise on bone, and anything in the negative region favors the non-throwing arm. The former throwers are the open circles, and continuing throwers are the, the filled in circles. And I just wanna focus on the form, former throwers. So people who were active and then stopped their activity. And so we can see in terms of measurements of the amount of bone, so cortical bone mineral content and cortical area, there's not a huge improvement, right? There's not a deficit in former th throwers, but they're you know close to the zero line. However, if you look at architectural measurements, so total area, total size of the bone, and this polar moment of inertia, which is another architecture measurement, you can see that there remains a significant benefit from exercise in the former throwers. So understanding bone health and how we can optimize it young can affect people for a lifetime. So for ACSM staff, bone health education in youth, um, or bone health education in youth and across the lifespan is important. 
Um, bone strengthening is a key guideline for children and adolescents. They suggest three days per week is the target. Stronger bones um, benefit um, is benefit from regular physical activity in children and adolescents, as we saw in the previous slide. However, the measurement of bone strength in particular is not a component of the fitness gram assessment, and um, I bet is not really involved directly in PE programs. And as we know, what get me gets measured gets done. And so I fear that many times skeletal health is merged with muscular health, is the musculoskeletal system, but what, what is a good training program for muscle is very different from training programs for bone health. And with that, um, I wanna thank my, my students over the years, in particular, the Kinesiology Research Group and the Center for Student Research. Um, I couldn't do anything without my students. And here's them at an ACSM meeting where we go in, in mass. And with that, I welcome any questions or discussion. All right, thank you. That's okay. a really, really interesting, what a great presentation. And I appreciate that you uh, included our staff and, and our, uh, our students as well in and, and your application section. We usually ask our presenters to do that, and sometimes we don't get to that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to, to do that. So we have some questions we want to start with. Uh, the first one is, okay, I, I hope I'm going to get these words pronounced right. Why? Uh, maybe you can explain a bit about the Sayers equation versus Johnson and Mohammedan formula for for or Harmon. Sorry, for example, can you explain some of those different uh, equations? Sorry about that. Okay. Yes. So so um, I'll just start with their limitations with the Sayers equation, um, and then there's been an evolution of the equation that. Uh, through Harmon and a, a previous uh, iteration of those equations and then going to the Sayers. Why we deter decided to stay with the Sayers is it was fairly robust with both males and females and in counter movement jumps and in squat jumps. And so to be super accurate, right, most of these equations want you to use a squat jump. And so you're starting from a certain position, so it's very, regulated, if you would. But for a field measurement, we decided that just doing a counter movement jump with the cue of jump as high as possible, however your normal mechanics works out, is what we're after. And especially, so so the Sayers equation was a little um, forgiving in that. Um, moving forward, we anticipate looking into other equations that are focused on on more on younger children, right? So that that will be always a, an open debate of what's the best equation to use. But moving forward, we decided not to have too strict of a jumping protocol because we, I mean, the end goal is to have this be used by teachers, coaches, who are not going to be well versed or have the time to to have such strict protocols. So I think I evaded the question a bit, but it, it currently it seems to be the most robust equation um, in the market. But that's that's Great. definitely a future research focus. All right. So we have another one here um, for children that are non ambulatory. How can we facilitate adequate amounts of skeletal loading in addition to standing devices? You can always focus on upper limb, right? So get creative with throwing exercises, using weighted med balls and things like that. Um, Non-ambulatory, like the, the devices that will allow partial body weight are really kind of focused on, on helping that population. Also, there seems to be some potential in vibration. So um, the same company that makes the PQCT also does some vibration uh, equipment. And so 
so that's a an um an avenue as well great and do you have any we have had several questions here about where folks might locate some good examples of exercises for kids um, around bone health do you have any suggestions where people might look um that's a great question. I mean, there is, and I don't have it with me because it's in my office where I haven't been forever. Um, there, there, there's a group up in Vancouver that does the jump at the bell. And so they'll have different, they put together a book that has different fun exercises for kids. But, but really bone exercise prescription is really simple. Bone likes high magnitude, short duration, and twice a day is optimal because it loves rest. And I always joke that bone is like a lazy tissue, um, but I try to rephrase that, that bone is super smart, right? All you have to do is jump up and down 10, 15 times and bone understands, all right, you're active, I'll do my thing and I will, I will adapt to make myself stronger so you can continue to do this. So anything, jumping, running, and the other thing that bone likes, which is, is not good for me as a, a marathon runner, it does not like repetition, consistent movements, right? So it loves court sports, anything with changes in direction. Um, actually, the best thing for kids are playgrounds. And in particular, how kids used to play on the playgrounds before we as parents watched them too much, right? Going up the slide backwards, jumping off high places, those are our intermittent high magnitude loading activities that are super optimal for bone. So, I, I mean, I guess um, let kids be kids or ask kids to show you crazy jumping routines and um, that would be great. And we actually thought for Boys and Girls Club of having like a dance competition during the end of one of these after school programs, right? Like really letting the kids drive it. Awesome, thank you. Answered. Yeah, that was a great answer. What about, um, what kind of logistical barriers have you encountered when trying to assess bone and muscle in adolescents and how have you circum circumnavigated those? Well, we are currently facing one of our, our major, so we, we've used college age athletes. We have expanded that to just healthy populations on a college campus, right? So that goes from 18, you know, into your 60s. We think now it's to add to Baptista's work, you know, there needs to be more bone strength and muscle function relationships in youth. Um, it is very hard to convince IRBs at times to uh, allow us to scan children. And so the, the barrier is our machine, like California is super strict on radiation machines. We've had the state come in and there is, there is such minimal radiation. But, but once you say the words into a non-bone focused group that there is some, you know, that the machine uses radiation, it, become, it becomes, a, um, I think, a communication barrier. And so we're, we're now trying to navigate how to how to explain to people the importance of this work for long-term bone health and just for the the body of literature in general um, to kind of assuage fears of the words radiation and children said in the same the same sentence. So ours are very practical barriers that we're currently running up against. All right. So this question is related to the P P C T. Um, it says it looks like it might be a useful predictor of stress fracturing athletes. Uh, what has been your experience with that? Um, so, so I have not, like I would love to monitor our, say our cross country athletes, or even not actually basketball, any, any of the sports on campus and kind of see how their bone changes if, if they present with a stress fracture actor yes or no i've not had the opportunity to do that but i'm um, currently i'm teaching a bone and exercise class and we reviewed a paper that looked at dexa and pqct to try to predict stress fracture and it's not 
as predictive as you would think. There's some bilateral differences, side to side differences you can see in in um, populations with stress fracture, but I think using it as a screening tool for stress fracture is still in its infancy. And so you'd have to use all the other, you know, predictors or, or kind of clinical assessments to, to kind of focus on that. All right, we have a, a series of questions here now about um, adults and older adults. So what would be preferred activities for adults? Um, is, is there a way or should we know like early adults, middle adults, older adults, are there different recommendations or are we sort of just uh, be active and do some strength training? Any, anything uh, specific you can offer? Yeah, and, and so ACSM, we had the bone health uh, uh, position statement and the National Osteoporosis Foundation and ACSM, we're, there's another one coming out. Um, but I think I, I think that, that it shouldn't just be be active and strength train. Like you should focus, especially if you're say a, a personal trainer or a coach, you should focus on bone, right? So high magnitude, strength training is great, um, but be very deliberate in focusing on bone because it's an easy add, right? Because bone does not need a lot of training. It's not like the cardiovascular system or even the mus muscular system. So if you add jump roping or, you know, any sort of box jumps or an any sort of um, skipping activities or, you know, get really creative. Um, but in terms of like throughout the lifespan, I think um, as I'm approaching like those older years, I, I, I get my, my backup when people are like, oh, in older populations, we do this. I think you take your client where they are and push them as far as you can push them, right? So you, I, I think we want to still have our elderly populations jump to the extent they can, because if you ease up and decrease their the intensity of their exercise, you'll both lose their type two muscle fibers, which helps them in preventing falls, and you will start to lose their bone mass. So I think this, you know, as far as older populations, like push them to the extent you can with high high magnitude activities. I think we should all be jumping, jumping rope. Great. So, and then we have some questions about what, what about people who are already faced with osteopenia or um, osteoporosis? Do you think supplements uh, help in conjunction with uh, the exercise? And, and, and then just to clarify on your last comment, what about jumping for those folks who are already sort of in that space of having some, some you know, architect changes to their bone, their bone health? Yeah, and so that's always the the worry, right? You don't want to be the person that you know fractures your grandmother. Um, but again, there then there have been some studies that have really pushed the envelope of high magnitude, right? Like in you know, with all safety precautions, but it, it's kind of you need to push them and it's not that you want to build bone at that point but you want to stop or decrease the slope of bone loss so maintaining bone mass is a win and um the the other problem too with osteoporosis is the screen like the the terminology osteopenia and osteoporosis it's still pretty loose as a screening tool, and that's why they had to say, okay, so a, a negative 2.5 T-score is osteoporosis with other risk factors, because people that were termed osteoporotic, only 50% of them would fracture, right? So it's, it was a still very loose, you know, it, it wasn't a very uh, focused diagnostic condition. So, with that being said, it's kind of like as if you were training anybody. I think ramping them up at a at a smart training adaptation approach is probably the way to do it. I don't think you would take somebody that said, "Oh, I you know I just got a DEXA scan and I'm osteopenic," 
and then you said well you know let's let's jump off this three foot high box but you can you can actually start to just like we would for muscle or cardiovascular health just kind of ramp it up um, and adapt them in, a, in a, a smart way the other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes it's better to look at two scans you know, usually people get them six months or a year apart. And if there's no big change, um, that could be a good indication because DEXA is still a 2D measurement and it's not giving the full architecture. And so somebody with a low BMD could have quite strong bones. They're just built in a, in a really smart way. Great. This is a really interesting question. Um, have you done any research focusing on bone health issues in dancers? Different kind of activity that we're not used to thinking about. Yeah. You know, and and um, so my interest, like my personal interest in this, came from um, me being a runner and then looking into the female athlete triad. So I had the opportunity to to hear Barbara Drinkwater speak during my my met and when I was in. My master's at, at Buffalo and then when you get into that literature it was all in ballet dancers and a huge community obviously in New York City um, but what struck me is that you would have these young professional athletes you know in their 20s who were diagnosed diagnosed as osteoporotic and were getting fractures and so that was that was really concerning you know just to me because you know running has a high incidence of, of stress fracture as well so, so a lot of the female athlete triad research and um, bone health was out of dance communities in particular in ballet. And, I, and there's actually a group at um, Long Island University in Brooklyn that focuses on dancers. I myself don't, but we have a new biomechanist coming on to Cal State East Bay, Dr. Rowley, who is focused on the biomechanics of, of dancers. And so we're hoping I'm hoping to collaborate with him. And he's actually interested in kind of broadening the focus on dance research out to, to kind of veer away from just ballet and kind of encompass um, dance more broadly. But it, and that's a great, like just dance in general is a great bone exercise, right? Variable loading, you can get some high loads, et cetera. So that's a, it's a good good activity all right we have time for a couple more questions so what about and if you think about college athletes for example they're you know very active they usually are doing strength training and then many of them once they leave college uh, their lifestyle changes uh, have you looked at the post-competitive sort of college athlete or elite athlete to see uh, what sort of longer term differences you might see in in bone health i have not but i would anticipate um based on stuart warden's work that that even if they suffered stress fracture or had some injuries early on that the net benefit that they could amass of their athletic during their athletic or competitive years should last them a lifetime and so he was able to again use baseball as a model and um apparently the ma major league and minor league baseball have an incredible alumni group and there's a paper out there a case study on somebody who is 93 years i think so basically f almost 50 years post baseball career and was still had advantages in structure and so so i would anticipate that if you gathered um, you know, the, the problem with gathering athletes post their, their competitive years is you don't have kind of the, the baseline, but I would anticipate in general, um, athletes benefit. Now, the thing is that some, since some athletes get, have a high incidence of stress fracture, they, there could be some athletes that, that have slender or relatively weak bones as opposed to other athletes who might have a more robust bone structure, kind of the comparison of the two bones that I showed. And so then I think the more interesting question becomes, instead of just saying all athletes should have strong bones, 
to kind of try to tease out, do we have athletes with more a more vulnerable bone structure that might need to be trained in a different way than somebody with a more robust bone structure, right? So you could almost use their bone structure and strength as a way to train them. Then there becomes issues in, you know, even though everybody I think accepts individualized training in terms of team sports, that gets very tricky right from a coaching perspective of i think it's a very smart approach right we're probably losing athletes that could be highly competitive with less training right not push them into injury but then you know then you get the why do they have to do less approach but if we can kind of spin it that people have even on teams have individualized training based on their their structure and, and physiology that i think that would be really taking coaching and training to a, a very nuanced level. Okay, so one final question here. So you have any suggestions around um, nutrition across, uh, we all know nutrition is important, right? But for bone health, anything that we should be doing in particular in combination with our exercise across various different uh, times in the lifespan? Well, so, I, so I'm not an RD, and so the only thing I can say is eat, eat healthy, eat a, a, a healthy diet. But in terms of calcium, there are requirements, right, that are recommended. And in general, we as Americans do not meet them, right? So that would probably be my first thing. Um, supplementation, it's always better to eat food rather than take calcium pills, because there is a limit of how much calcium can be absorbed. So, so you, you'd have to, even if you were going to take calcium pills, they need to be spread out so you could absorb them. But again, I think it's always a better focus to try to have calcium in your morning meal, afternoon, evening, and with snacks. So eating is, is always better. Um, I work with somebody who's an RD and um, so she deals with the nutrition side. And so, so the artificial silly question is what's more important nutrition or exercise, um, which is, is a silly question, right? They're both equally important, but um, it's a fun argument. And obviously it's exercise. As long as you have enough calcium, you're good. <laughs> so what, one fun question, what's your favorite uh, jumping exercise to incorporate, to incorporate into your personal fitness routine, Dr. Yingling? So I, we have um, a program called Get Fit, Stay Fit that trains faculty and staff. So my students train me um, and they always try to get me to do box jumps, but on the nice soft ones, right? So the jumping down is probably better for bone, but you know, just getting that strength to be able to jump, you know, and I was getting, you know, mid thigh level, I was doing pretty well. Um, so I do enjoy those, but then I tried to, I was in a parking lot of a target so and sometimes you have these like different elevations like you have like the drain runoff ditches and then so it's like an elevation right and so my kids were walking across and then jumped did a vertical jump out of this little place where there were plants and i being the smart adult thought i'm trained i can do a vertical jump like my kids and I could not, and I um, hit my tibia and split open my skin so I could see my my um, tibia anterior. So I need to go back and train a little bit more for that vertical jump. But the positive of my stupid behavior is I did not break my bone. So so the jumping was doing doing me um, a good service. So, but in general, I think everybody should try to do these these um, push their, themselves and try to do activities that that may not be smart, but at least keep you active. I had to chuckle there because I would be the person that would, you know, somehow fall. So I uh, end up with an injury when I'm trying to do something good for myself, right? Yeah. So, all right, everyone, thank you again, Vanessa. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot today. I don't probably know as much as I should about bone. So that was really wonderful. So we thank you for your time. We thank all the participants for the great questions. And as a final reminder, we want to, re we want to tell everyone, don't forget that our annual meeting is going to be held this year, June 1st through 5th. It's going to be virtual this year. 
So be sure to visit the website, acsm.org. Um, if you go to the annual meeting area, um, early bird discounts in soon, May 1st. So we hope you'll all, all join us at the annual meeting as well. So with that, we're going to say one more big thank you to Dr. Yingling, and we're going to end the webinar. Could I say one thing? Sure. Okay, it's, it's like anybody, if you have any additional questions, like feel free to email me. You can find me um, at Cal State East Bay, Vanessa.yingling at csueastbay.edu. Oh, great. Thanks, Vanessa.